I'm delighted to be here. I see some familiar faces. Um, welcome. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, I hope you have had some cocktails because you might need it. <laughs> Just kidding. I've kept it very light. We want to have a conversation. So I'm a neuroscientist and I get, get paid to study this blob of tissue. This three pound blob of flesh is actually what has the seat of your all of your knowledge, all emotions, all passions, and all of your memories. It has 86 billion neurons and 150 trillion synapses, and it operates on 20 watts of power, which is less than that bulb there. So I think it's a worthy question to figure out how brains work and when it fails during disease, what can it teach us about how um, you know, behavior arises because this blob of tissue is what enables us to do everything. Now, one of the things that brains allows us to do is language. We all use language every day. And for a long time, it was thought that language is what separates us humans from other animals. Language is the pinnacle of human evolution. It allows us to write poetry. It allows us to communicate ideas. It allows us to send astronauts to the moon. But the uh, French uh, philosopher Descartes, you know, many centuries ago, he posited that the language is what separates us from the brutes. And by brutes, he meant rest of the animal kingdom. But over the years, new research has shown that the divide between humans and animals is not as great as we initially thought. There are several components of language that we already find very prominently in many animals. So for example, if one were to study how language is acquired, you might be tempted to study a babbling infant, like my son who just strolled in. <laughs> so that's Ahir, he is nine months old, and he's starting to babble a lot. Um, but my wife might object to certain experiments that I want to do with Ahir. So, the next best option is to use a songbird, say for example, a starling or a nightingale. And in this picture is a zebra finch. Um, and they have this remarkable ability to learn their vocalizations from their dad. And once they learn it, they can make this exact piece of vocalization for their entire life. So if one is really interested in understanding how the brain learns new languages, you can use something like this. You might be interested in understanding how vocalizations can convey meaning. And if you're interested in that, you might be tempted to study a macaque or a monkey that you know has calls of various kinds. So for example, it will have a specific call when it's alarmed and there's a predator around and it makes that alarm call and everybody in that species knows what it means and they'll avoid the predator. Or you might be interested in social interactions. And in this case, you might be tempted to study a dolphin because dolphins make wonderful vocalizations, especially in the context when they're interacting with each other. What I want to study in the lab and what we do study in the lab called vocal interactions. So not only as humans do we have language and we speak, but we actually can participate in conversation. And that takes a lot more from the brain. So let me explain that. So we have all had conversations. Think about your last conversation. You know, you were talking to probably your friend and you were saying something and the friend was listening to it and responding back. And what if I told you that the typical time it takes for one partner to finish their vocalization and for you to start speaking is 200 milliseconds, which is one fifth of a second. That's really, really fast. And think of all that needs to happen in that one fifth of a second. You need to hear the auditory input. You need to process the auditory input. You need to access your memory, trying to understand what those words mean. Then you need to prepare for an action. And then you need to decide whether you want to respond or not. And then you have to plan for it and move your muscles appropriately in order to speak the words that you want to say. All of this happens in one fifth of a second. And that's really remarkable. And although you know we know from a lot of studies in the humans that what brain areas are involved, it's really like a parts list, and we really don't understand exactly how that works. We understand that, you know, maybe some auditory region is involved. We may understand that some motor regions are involved, but how exactly 
does the auditory information pass to the motor system and how exactly do we plan and how exactly do we move our muscles? None of that is really understood. So that's basically the question that we are interested in. And obviously, as you can imagine, that um, this process that feels very natural, uh, very obvious to us, sometimes fails. So for example, if you have a stroke in this part of the brain called the Broca's area, it's one of the first areas in the brain that were that was identified to have a strong behavioral effect by Paul Broca many centuries ago. This is in the left brain, uh, left part of the brain in the front of the brain called the Broca's area. What happens is there is an aphasia. And what we do we mean by aphasia? There is a strong disability to form coherent sentences. Like for example, if I had had a lesion in my Broca's area, I wouldn't be able to say these words at all. So there's a lot of importance to trying to understand how things go wrong. And we can't really do that unless we understand what are the basic brain areas that are involved and how they talk to each other. Now, obviously we can't start by doing these experiments in the humans. And now is the right time to introduce you to the protagonist of today's story. These are the singing mice from Costa Rican rainforest. They're pretty famous. They were featured in the New York Times in 2019. And um, the journalist uh, he captured exactly the behavior very well, which is that these mice sing to one another, but politely. Okay, so let me tell you about the behavior of these mice. And I can describe it to you, but I think it's best if I just play the video. So here's a video. There are two singing mice in this video. There's one on the left and there's one on the right. We have them in the lab and they are arranged such that these mice are in separate boxes. They can't see each other. They can't smell each other, but they can only hear each other. Okay, so whatever you, are, you will see is being communicated by the, the, the voice of the animal. So it's basically an auditory phenomenon. Can we have the video, please? Okay, so there are several things that happened. So the animal here, it made this long vocalization that almost sounded like a bird. This is highly unusual for a rodent to do this. This was seven to 10 seconds long. The other animal kept searching for where the vocalization is coming and then just got ready, prepared to vocalize. And when this animal finished its vocalization, started responding. And if you actually do this over and over again and do the statistics of how long it takes for this to happen, it usually is around 200, 300 milliseconds, which is of the same order of time scale that we humans take. Okay, so let's play it one more time so that we can actually see what happens. <laughs> My son is protesting for some reason. <laughs> Look at how this animal is trying to search for where the sound is coming from. And then this animal is dead. How many of you can actually hear it? No. So it, it strongly correlates with age and with how many like, sorry to say, and how many like jazz concerts you have been to? So, Technically, this is human audible. You can actually hear it um, most of the time. Okay. Now, more recently, we realized that the social behavior of this animal is richer than we thought. So, for example, if we now allow these animals to come close to each other, which we didn't in the previous experiment, they actually make a lot more vocalizations. Okay. So, let's see if this video plays. The chirping, yes. And the female sings, the male chirps.
Okay, so you heard like a few minutes of what happens when these animals interact. Now you can see there's a lot of richness to their behavior. They're making a lot of different kinds of chirps, a lot of different kinds of shapes. Sometimes the male sings and sometimes the female sings and all of this rich behavior is happening when you allow these animals to come close to each other. And uh, we were doing these experiments, including Cliff, who is uh, here, and we kept watching this for hours and kept wondering, what are they saying to each other? Right? Can we figure out what is it that they are trying to communicate? And it's really hard, right? Because we can't ask them what they're actually trying to say. And uh, in some sense, we realize that it's actually similar to what happens when you're trying to figure out what an old ancient language means. So for example, I want to give you an analogy to try to give you a sense of what it feels like when we are trying to do these experiments in the lab and trying to figure out what the meaning of these vocalizations are. So for example, this is Linear B. This is a language um, that was used about 1600 BC, so 4000 years ago, in this island of Crete in the Mediterranean. Um, and it looks like this. There are lots of bunch of scribbles and we really don't quite understand when we first encounter it what it means, right? We can't ask them. Those people are, you know, have ceased to exist for a long time. So what do we do? So there are some established techniques for how we could analyze the content of such meaning. So for example, you can do what is called the frequency analysis of symbols. For example, you see all of these symbols and you can simply ask how many symbols are there. So for example, in this case, they found out there are 90 symbols and that's already informative because it's too many for it to be an alphabetic language like English and it's too few for it to be a completely pictographic language where every symbol contains, you know, a meaning. So 90 meant that it's probably a syllabic language where each symbol constitutes a syllable. Okay. You can figure out the pairwise uh, frequency. So which symbol follows which symbol and all of this actually tells you a lot. So can you actually tell me in English, what is the most common symbol? What's the most common alphabet? E, exactly. E happens about 12% of the time, okay? Followed by A and Z being the one that's least used. So you can use these principles. You can use other things. For example, you see that this symbol always appears at the end of words, in spite of it being two different words. And this symbol appears at the end of other kinds of words. This is similar to, for example, uh, things in Italian. If you say buono and or buona, that means it's either the masculine or the female, the feminine version of these words. So you know that these symbols might stand for something like O and N. But then you can also use educated guesses like context. So for example, this language was used in this island of Crete in the Mediterranean and they were used for commerce. So perhaps one of the more repeated words would be the towns or the ports that were there in that island. So in fact, you can try to guess that and say, okay, so this might be O, this might be A. Okay, let's guess that this could be Aminisos. And then if you try to do that, it's like, okay, maybe the second town is actually another port town and so on and so forth. So you make educated guesses based on the context and you check whether your guesses are right. The reason I said all of this is it turns out that we actually had to resort to very similar techniques when we were trying to figure out what these mice were saying to each other. So this is the full decipherment of that linear B script. And once you know this based on those principles, you can actually read what this means. Now we tried to do the exact same thing for the mice. So first we took this entire vocalization. You saw a lot of different symbols, a lot of different scribbles that these mice were making. And we tried to figure out what are the syllables. And we found that there are some syllables the mice are making that look like down sweep. So they go just down in frequency. So by the way, this is um, a plot where the X axis on the horizontal is time and the Y axis is pitch. Okay. So when things go down, it's basically like, right? So it starts at high pitch and then goes down. When it, if it's flat, then it's basically like a pure tone, like a, you know, piano key like at A or something. And you find that there are lots of syllables, some, some syllables that go down, some syllables that are trilly, there are wavy patterns. And we figured out that if you took all of the syllables and tried to map them, they fall into two clusters. Those that are really loud and form these songs that I initially 
showed you. And then all the others that form these call clusters, and they can be broken down into various shapes. But then we use the context clues. So for example, if you have the two animals not separated such that they can't interact, but they actually can interact, we notice that when they're really close to each other, they start making these wavy kinds of notes. And when they're really far away, they make these loud, long songs. Okay, so that's a clue that perhaps the songs are for long distance communication because they're really loud and happens when they can't really see each other. And when they're really close, within a few body lengths of each other, they're making these really soft ultrasonic vocalizations that we can't hear, but they can hear obviously. So by doing experiments of this kind, we kind of know what symbols correspond to what meaning. Okay, so we can try to ascribe and understand what these animals are communicating with each other. We wanted to go a step further. For example, we have a sequence of syllables and then we want to know, well, can we predict what the next syllable will be? Can we understand what the animal is going to do next? And perhaps for that, what we need is a history of this animal, what the animal has been doing so far for a few seconds and what the other animal doing, maybe the partner. So for example, think about your conversation. Perhaps it's actually possible to figure out what the next sentence, next word of this sentence will be, right? So there's a lot of information in the statistics of sentences that one can use to figure out what the animals are trying to communicate with each other. And we wanted to do this exercise in collaboration with uh, Ben, who is sitting right there, who is also a faculty at Cosby Harbor. Ben, raise your hand. <laughs> so we are trying to understand if we can use the vocalization of one animal and the other animal and their locations to try to predict exactly what the next vocalization will be. If we can do that, that would be fantastic because then we would understand what they are trying to communicate with each other. And this is essentially like a chat GPT for vocal communication. I don't know if you guys know about chat GPT. It's this new thing where, uh, you know, it's really good at language models and it can write things for you. So what it does is exactly that. So given some command, some history of what the words are, it's really good at predicting what the next one would be. So this would be sort of a chat GPT for vocal communication. And we hope that we won't, we will be able to do this. Now, why are we interested in doing this? Why are we interested in figuring out what these animals are saying to each other? I can think of three reasons. One is, you know, we want to be like Dr. Doolittle and we want to be able to communicate with animals. That would be wonderful. Second, the animals, you know, share our world and we want to understand what they're saying. And it's really important for even conservation purposes. And people are using bioacoustics for conservation, trying to imagine what happens if over time, you suddenly find that some species are being extinct and they're stopping to communicate. So figuring out what the sounds are in a forest, for example, or in an ocean is a really good measure to figure out uh, the biodiversity. But the third reason, which is closest to my heart, is this is because we want to understand the brain. We want to understand behavior and how brains create behavior and vocal behaviors are simply a way to understand how neurons and neural circuits in the brain create behavior. So for example, this is a cartoon of what the rodent brain looks like. This is sort of a cartoon version of what the singing mouse brain looks like. And we know there are certain brain regions that are really important, like motor cortex and then you know, other brain regions in blue. And we want to understand how these brain regions actually can create these vocalizations, what brain regions are necessary for these vocalizations, so I want to just share with you one experiment that a graduate student in my lab, Mike Zeng did. And this experiment I found pretty remarkable, which is that this is this particular brain area called PAG. Don't worry about it. It's in a long name. It's in the midbrain. It's in us too. So what happens is that this brain region um, has been shown to be important for vocalization. So the experiment that Mike did he expressed light sensitive channels in neurons in this brain region. What it means is that if you shine light on these neurons, these neurons get activated. And then whatever happens because of the activation of this neuron, you can actually um, figure out. So let's see if we can play this video. Um, excellent.
So the mouse is hanging out. It has a fiber on its head through which we'll deliver some light. The light is being delivered. And you see these squiggles that happen? So it's basically, we have figured out a brain region where if you can activate that brain region, you can create some of the behaviors that I showed you before. So you simply took some light activable protein, put it in those neurons in the brain region called PAG. You, we used this fiber to shine light on that brain region in a mouse that's just hanging out. And the mouse feels compelled to make these vocalizations, which essentially tells you that these neurons in this PAG and are, are sufficient to drive this behavior. And this is kind of the experiments that we can do. We can do the opposite experiment. We can inhibit brain regions and figure out what its contributions are to the, to the particular behavior that we study. My point of showing this video to you is to highlight the point again that what we really want to do is to understand how neural circuits in the brain operate. How does the auditory information get to the motor system? How do we actually do you know conversation in a mammalian brain so i will end by going back to where i started this brain is what we are interested in i'm a neuroscientist we would really like to understand how brains function and how it fails during certain diseases and um, i want to end with this quote that i find pretty illuminating which is if the brain were so simple that we could understand it we would be so simple that we couldn't it's not a pessimistic view, it just means that I have job security. <laughs>